Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, uh, teaching and training translation technologies in SSA disciplines, Clarin Cafe. I'm Francesca Frontini from the Clarin Eric Board of Directors. And uh, uh, Clarin Cafes are informal and interactive spaces of discussions for researchers, lecturers, students, and experts uh, uh, to share experiences and insights that have potential relevance for the activities and developments of the Clarin infrastructure. And if you are new uh, to Clarin, uh, you will uh, hear about it uh, more in detail in the short introduction I will uh, give you in a, in a couple of minutes. Today's cafe is organized by a group of people, uh, Vesna, Vincent, uh, Yanisa, Ralph, uh, Julia, myself, and Juliana van der Leck, uh, who are uh, both from uh, insiders of Clarin and also uh, experts in, in the topic uh, of today. Uh, Juliana and myself are also, will also be the, the hosts uh, for today, chairing this session, and the coordination and technology technical support will be provided by Christine and David. So for any problems, uh, you please write in the chat, if technical problems, please write, write in the chat. This event is recorded uh, for further dissemination purposes. And if you have uh, questions or comments, you indeed can write it in the chat or there will be a moment of discussion later on. So this is today's schedule after a short introduction uh, to Clarin that uh, will be given by myself. Uh, we will hear about uh, the new, new uh, role of uh, translation technologies and didactic resources uh, uh, to uh, get to know more about this topic, as well as tools and resources, and also have an introduction about uh, how machine translation works. Then there will be an ample space for questions and answers. If we are here kind of hosting you uh, from the Clarin Eric Research Infrastructure. Clarin stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It is uh, a European research infrastructure consortium and a well-established uh, 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 landmark in the panorama of research infrastructures in Europe. And it aims at providing easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond to digital language data in written, spoken and multimodal form as well as to advance tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate and analyze and combine such resources wherever they are located. When necessary, so when, when these resources are password protected, this is done by a system of single sign-on so that you can always use your institutional academic uh, um, login to access any resource anywhere. It also serves as an ecosystem for knowledge sharing and training, and Clarin Cafes are, of course, part of this ecosystem. And uh, it is one of the infrastructures that uh, participate in the SSH op uh, Open Science Cluster, so Social Sciences and Humanities Cluster of Research Infrastructures, which in turn are participating together with other class science clusters in the creation of the European Open Science Cloud. How uh, Clarin works, it is a distributed virtual infrastructure that consists in a network of distributed uh, data centers in uh, uh, 24 member countries, two observers, and also in third countries, third parties countries. As you can see from the map, we're not just located in Europe, we have South Africa as a full member as of this year. And uh, these, uh, these, these data centers share and make available uh, the resources that I was talking about. So how, the, how does Clarin work? Actually, the added value is that uh, this distributed network of centers uh, is uh, in, in a way coordinated and federated in such a way that uh, you do not need to know where data or tool, tools are stored because there is a, an overlay, a technological overlay that allows you to find and act and, and, uh, and use these resources uh, and this is done via uh, some core services that also heavily use and exchange metadata from these centers. More concretely, uh, the two core services of Clarin are the Virtual Language Observatory, the VLO, that collects the metadata from all the centers and allows you to, via faceted search, to search, identify uh, resources, but also have details on the licenses, on the citation, uh, on uh, uh, what tools they can match with, and then um, lets you uh, uh, use them and uh, where, where they are actually located. 
And then there's the language resources switchboard, which is uh, the same, but for tools. It allows you to enter data and find via matchmaking a system based on metadata again, which uh, services provided by the various clearing centers can be combined. So for instance, a, a, corpus, in a corpus in a given language can find a, a processing tool that uh, is adapted to it. Uh, another way to explore uh, Clarin is via its resource families. These are a little bit more uh, geared towards uh, humans, uh, human consumption, so to say. They are a uh, user-friendly overview of per data type of the available language resources in the Clarin infrastructure. I highlighted here, given the topic of today, parallel corpora, for instance, that can be useful for trans machine translation training. And uh, also, as I said, Clarin is also an infrastructure for knowledge sharing and expertise. Uh, there's a number of committees, uh, for instance, also the legal and ethical committees, the uh, standard and the interoperability, the user involvement. We have a trainers network. We have a, a network of Clarin ambassadors. And there's also the possibility of visiting the various centers via mobility grants. Uh, in particular, uh, the Clarin knowledge infrastructure is composed by, uh, of knowledge centers uh, that you can contact not to get uh, data resources, but rather expertise. And in particular, here I've ha highlighted the centers, the case centers that uh, list in their expertise uh, translation studies, translation corpora, machine translation, and translation memories. And by the way, two of the people present here today are from such centers. Um, and uh, it center, these centers are, have typically have a help desk functionality. Uh, so you can, on their web pages, you can type your question and it will be answered within 48 hours. But we also now have recently launched a central clearing forum. These, these slides will be available so you have all the relevant links. So I just wanted to highlight also the Clarin Learning Hub, uh, where you can find a number of uh, useful resources uh, and other uh, relevant uh, information about uh, training. Um, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> so I now hand it over to our first uh, speaker um, from the actual Clarin Cafe, who is uh, Vesna Uzici from the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Vienna and also member of the Clarin Knowledge Infrastructure Committee and member of the Clarin Trainers Network for the first presentation. Uh, the floor is yours, Vesna. All right, everybody. So my presentation will tackle very basic, basic questions, which are what is translation and what does translation technology has to do with this, or better to say, what is the role uh, of translation uh, technology? Um, so um, the definition of translation or defining translation might seem quite trivial at first glance. Uh, translation is an ancient practice. Think, for example, of Rosetta Stone that you see here uh, with its multilingual inscriptions or think of biblical translation by Saint Jerome. So um, why do we need to talk about what is translation before we start talking about translation technology? Um, you would actually expect that um, translation studies, uh, which is the academic discipline that is focused on the practice of translation, the practitioners, the, pro the processes and products in this regard, um, could provide a clear definition. Um, but let's just take an example of um, a major reference work, uh, such as this one by Baker and Saldana. They do not offer one. Um, so uh, it seems that translation seems to be um, quite um, a convoluted concept um, and not so easily defined as, for example, um, dictionary uh, would suggest. Um, dictionaries usually define translation as um, a process um, um, and the product of converting text from one language uh, to another. Um, and if we have a look at some definitions stemming from translation studies, we do see that, for example, stemming from Bielsa, she suggested we need to expand this. Um, quite narrow definition. So um, I'm just offering some definitions here. I saw that some uh, people said that they are more um, interested in the topic or more uh, 
uh, have more knowledge on this. So this is just very uh, some uh, uh, selected definitions just to show you that um, there has been uh, quite um, a uh, varied and quite multifaceted discussion in the translation studies, um, what translation is. Um, there are even some radical approaches, such as, for example, a relativist approach suggested by Thury, um, where translation is whatever is presented or regarded as translation on any grounds, whatever. So this means that translation scholars have gone beyond this basic definition, um, and there is still debate on how to define the conceptual boundaries or whether a core meaning of translation exists. However, if we want to talk about translation technologies, we do need to um, narrow this down a bit. So let's have a look at some examples of translation so that we have a common ground for today's discussion. Um, just as an introductory uh, um, uh, categorization, typically, uh, at least in English, under translation, we do understand written translation in comparison to interpreting, which is um, usually um, in spoken form. Of course, there are also uh, mixed methods here, uh, but um, today we will focus mostly on the modality of written translation, um, but you have definitely encountered um, some interpreting, for example, at conferences, such as conference interpreting, or maybe you have seen examples of dialogue interpreting. Uh, in the medical domain and so on. So this is not something that we will focus on today uh, in too much uh, depth. Um, however, looking at the practice uh, of uh, translating, we do see that practitioners um, are offering often services, for example, translation service providers that can go beyond this um, very basic categorization. Um, think about, uh, for example, adaptation, um, transcreation is also a new kit on the block that is being offered by um, translation companies, then subtitling, um, dubbing, uh, and so on. So um, there is not only a vast um, discussion about translation in the translation studies, but also among the professionals, um, what are the services that are being offered, especially with uh, machine translation taking over uh, some of the services previously uh, being done by human translators. Um, this is, however, not a very new uh, discussion and a new idea. Um, for example, the distinction between intralingual, interlingual, and intersemiotic translation, meaning within the same language, from German to German, from then interlingual, from German into English, or intersemiotic, from uh, oral to written mode, uh, was already suggested in 1959 uh, by Jacobson. And in the recent years, with the boom of, for example, streaming platforms and um, um, various um, uh, services um, over the web, uh, you do see that this is definitely a big part of the translation industry. Uh, for example, uh, subtitling, subtitling for um, the heart of hearing, and so on and so forth. You do see some examples here um, on this slide uh, for this practice. Um, the main idea behind all of these practices is what the uh, industry typically calls fit for purpose, meaning that there is no translation being done in a vacuum, but it is typically done for a specific user group or for a specific purpose. And this is also, for example, something that has been picked up by translation studies scholars, but also practitioners in terms of for example, um, intralingual translation, um, as you see in this example, translating into plain English. So these are also services that are being offered by translation professionals. On the other hand, this fit for purpose also means that 
the majority of translation experience that a user has is probably just translation. And nowadays with the ubiquity of different software applications on mobile phones and so on, um, you can easily, uh, you know, um, use Google Lens uh, to translate from here Spanish into English or use the translation button on social media, as you see in, on this example on Instagram. Or if you want to check how your hotel um, is, uh, um, you can also use the translate button, uh, for example, on booking.com. So the translation seems to be everywhere nowadays. Um, for our user group, meaning the uh, researchers in various domains, translation often means a common knowledge production. So this means that this is not necessarily just a practice of text production, but it's also a collaborative practice in, for example, international teams where we need to um, decide, for example, how to define concepts, how to um, designate a designation to a certain new concept. Think, for example, um, of COVID, um, as you see on this example uh, that we also have in Clarin on um, COVID-19, where uh, a thesaurus, uh, a multilingual thesaurus was prepared. Um, you also see on this slide an example uh, from uh, a biodiversity uh, thesaurus where also a French uh, English knowledge production have taken place, uh, defining definition, writing definitions in um, both languages uh, and so on and so forth. So this means that um, the this collaborative process of translation and exchange is often in the core of um, nowadays um, research activities. I'm just um, showing you here another example stemming from the PISA study. Um, and this is the Italian example um, and just a snippet of the uh, PISA study that you know, is being uh, conducted in schools um, in um, uh, European um, countries. And here you see um, a part of the survey in Italian and in German. So there is a rigorous translation process behind uh, this um, uh, survey. Um, this means that the translation as a process and as a text production is a often situated in a certain context. It is embedded often in, in, in the institutional context or in the uh, context of the uh, technological uh, framework, but is also extended in the sense that um, it also incorporates technology and also um, knowledge from various disciplines. So there are also professionals uh, from several domains working on this text production. As an example, I'm showing you here uh, multilingual um, legal drafting that is a crucial part of uh, European institutions here with the European Treaty um, on um, European Union. So um, this is um, something that we need to consider that the translation is often an integral part um, of um, a knowledge production, uh, text production, and so on. So this means that um, it Translation is not just an act of, you know, converting one text from one language into another, but there is often quite a um, rigorous and complex process behind it. Um, I'm just showing you here an example of um, game localization. So uh, for mobile games or similar, and you see that this is a multi-step and uh, multi-layer uh, process. Um, on the other hand, translation also remains a decision-making process. Um, this means that um, also on the uh, conceptual level, there needs to be decision taking uh, taken in sense of um, which word do I use in a uh, certain context. Is Guangxi a connection, a relationship, um, a social network? Is it all voice network? 
or for example, I myself am a legal translator. Um, if, uh, for example, translating from um, Moroccan Arabic to um, to German, there are discrepancies uh, between legal systems. I need to make a decision how to approach uh, such uh, a text. Um, translation does not often happen in a vacuum, as already uh, mentioned, but is part of a collaborative um, a process. It is often distributed, uh, translators, customers, uh, translation project managers often do not sit in the same room, uh, but it is also a communicative endeavor uh, that is mediated uh, by uh, technology. And this brings us to translation technology and what translation technology can do or how it can enhance or support um, this uh, multifaceted, um, quite challenging process. Um, in terms of efficiency, um, translation technology can reduce the time required to translate, especially large volumes of text. On the other hand, um, especially in specialized translation, um, we need to ensure the consistency of text. So this is another aspect where translation technology can help us to ensure that consistency is given throughout uh, several documents, projects, and so on. Think of the PISA survey where consistency needs to be um, ensured throughout um, the uh, country versions of the survey. Then on the other hand, you want to make your research accessible to as many people as possible. So it may be um, interesting that you also translate um, your um, educational materials and so on for a wider uh, audience. Um, Real-time communication is another um, aspect that translation technology can help us with. For example, social media interactions, international collaboration and so on is already mentioned. and. Um, of course, we also need to um, emphasize the cost effectiveness of translation technology. Automating several processes in translation process can lower the costs associated with translation. So this was just a small teaser what translation is and how translation technology can uh, help us uh, with translation. And I give over to uh, the next speakers. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Janisa Hackenbuchner and I'm here together with Ralph Kruger and we are talking about specifically didactic resources for teaching data literacy in the context of machine translation literacy. Um, and before we go and talk about specific resources, we wanted to kind of give an overview as well um, as to what competences are needed nowadays in order to work with translation technologies, but also in order to train, well, either yourself <laughs> or other people um, to train people um, to then use translation technologies. And we've split it up into the two um, sections. So basically it's very uh, important nowadays to know the theoretical foundations and to understand topics such as data literacy, professional machine translation literacy, and also nowadays AI literacy. And then on the other hand, um, be able to have a few practical skills. And we've kind of split them up into skills that some of them you need to be able to actively do and some you need to be able to understand. And um, we categorize that you need to be able to use tools such as CAD tools, um, MT systems, nowadays also LLMs. Um, it can be very, very helpful to understand how, um, how these systems work. So, for example, neural networks, including the transformer architecture, um, to know more about data sources and also about general concepts of machine learning. And we'll hear more about that later in Vincent's talk. Um, and then it is also helpful nowadays if we know how to program or if at least sort of we've tried to do a few things and in general linguists and translators don't usually um, study and learn um, or do it in their own time um, programming but we can see it as just another language and languages 
um, we know. So it can always be very helpful to program uh, yourselves nowadays um, and also fine tune large language models potentially. Um, and in order to learn these skills, there are um, many resources online. Um, and some of these we will um, go ahead and introduce now as well. Right. We, we start with some theoretical foundations. Most of them were laid in the Data Lit MT project, which Janissa will be talking about uh, later. We start with, I think it's data literacy on the next slide. No, we, we start with professional machine translation literacy. There's a work by uh, Lynn Bauker uh, on, uh, who coined the term uh, machine translation literacy. There's a good definition given here by O'Brien Ernstberger Dow. I'm not going to read it, but basically having a critical awareness of how to how to use MT and what the, what the implications of of using this technology are. There's a growing body of, of literature and translation studies mostly on MT literacy, and for data lit MT, we um, we we took this concept and developed it further into into the concept of we call it professional machine translation literacy which was intended to co cover all MT-related competences required if you want to participate successfully in the MT-assisted professional translation process. So we, we're mostly concerned with uh, professional translation as compared to layperson lay translation. Already now, now some words on data literacy. There's a high societal relevance of data literacy because modern societies have become heavily datafied, data datafied in the last decades. And uh, events like the recent Corona pandemic, where there's a, a lot of uh, high volumes of, of data, uh, sometimes uh, competing data of various sources, you could see that societies uh, as a whole ha had problems uh, dealing with these high amounts of data to, in to interpret them, them correctly, to contextualize them, etc. So uh, data literacy is uh, relevant both at individual professional, but also at overall societal levels. There's a range of uh, definitions of data literacy often overlapping, also often applying to different contexts. There's one widely accepted definition by Ritzdale et al., which is uh, rather context-free, and it refers to being able to collect data, to manage them, evaluate them, and apply them, and more importantly, in a critical manner. So it's not just technical skills, but also this, this critical awareness of what it involves dealing with with data. And for Data Lit MT, for our project, we, we wanted to, to, um, to work on the interface between data literacy and machine translation literacy. And the link, as we saw it, was that neural machine translation, which is the, the current paradigm in, in machine translation, um, it is part of the data-driven or, or corpus-based machine translation paradigm. And therefore, I mean, data serves as, as the, the, yeah, the, the training material for these MT systems. So we, we thought that MT literacy, literacy must be integrated with data literacy, which is what we did in our project. Right. And uh, to provide some structure to this concept of professional MT literacy, we, we developed a corresponding framework. And there we distributed um, MT literacy over five main dimensions. The first we call technical MT literacy. This is what Janissa was talking about, that it's helpful to understand, at least at a, at a basic level, how these technologies work. Um, then linguistic MT literacy. This is the somewhat the, the, the traditional uh, MT dimension that linguists or translators ha had to deal with, like preparing te text for optimal machine translation or post-editing text that had been machine translated. Then we have a dimension which is called economic MT literacy, which is concerned with how you implement this techn technology into actual uh, translation workflows in the language industry. Societal MT literacy is another important dimension which deals with, well, how the the image or well, the, the public and the industry internal image of translators is shaped in light of these powerful, powerful uh, language technologies, such as machine translation. And then the final um, dimension we call cognitive MT literacy. This involves metalinguistic awareness of uh, how using MT may impact our cognitive processes, some aspects like priming, that if, if I read a machine translated sentence, uh, my, my post-edited sentence will bear some traces of this, this machine template. So it would look different as if I would translate it from scratch, et cetera. So this metacognitive meta uh, dimension, which is also relevant um, in MT use. And uh, to, to structure the, the, the data literacy um, dimension, we, we 
um, developed the, the data lit MT framework, which we, as we call it, this models the typical data life cycle in a machine translation project. It starts with a rather abstract data con context, which is more about raising actual awareness that uh, some problems in your organization could be solved with data, but also what are the, the ethical or the, the legal implications of, of using this data. Then data planning is once you've identified a certain task you want to support or solve with data, how do you get this data? What are data sources you could use? How you could you um, evaluate the quality of this data? This feeds into the data collection or production dimension where you actually collect data once you have um, identified sources and then use this data, for example, to train a machine translation system, which then produces new data the machine translated texts or sentences. And these data you could then feed into a data evaluation phase where, for example, you perform a manual or automatic um, quality evaluation of this machine translated data. And this would then feed into a, a data use phase where you see, for example, you wanted to raise productivity of your translators by implementing machine translation. You collect productivity or, or quality data on these machine translation workflows, and then you would decide, does this work? Do we have to readjust our workflows, et cetera? So the, as I said, the typical data uh, life cycle in a machine translation project. And uh, for didactic purposes in our project, we established a mapping between the two frameworks. So which sub-dimensions of data literacy interface with which sub-dimensions of professional MT literacy. And the idea was that the sub-dimension of data literacy in our project told us which competences we want to develop in learners. And the sub-dimensions of professional MT literacy provided the actual application context in which we wanted to teach these, um, these competences. The idea was that data literacy for translation studies or linguistic programs, there's not a natural fit between data literacy and the core subject matters of these um, study programs, as opposed, for example, to information technology. And uh, we thought, well, if you're studying translation, you're familiar nowadays with machine translation. We have this data dimension of machine translation. So uh, MT literacy would provide the actual application context in which we, uh, we want, want to develop data literacy in our students. And then the, the natural next step was to go from data literacy and machine translation literacy to the overall or the broader concept of AI or artificial intelligence literacy. This was also inspired by, well, the, the publication of, of ChatGPT in late 2022. It, it somewhat overlapped with our data lit MT project. Um, there's a widely accepted definition of AI literacy by Long Magerko from, from 2020 that you're able to, to critically evaluate AI technologies, communicate and collaborative, collaborate effectively with AI and use these technologies, um, both at home and in the workplace. And if we look at these three competences, the, the interfaces as we see them are as follows. The interface between MT literacy and data literacy, this is basically what I talked about just now and what, what data lit MT operationalized was uh, that corpus-based or data-driven Machine translation provides the interface between the two concepts. The interface between data literacy and AI literacy is the paradigm of machine learning, the overall artificial intelligence paradigm where you train neural networks on large amounts of, of data, not only in translation, but also in speech recognition, image recognition, etc. And the interface between MT literacy and AI literacy, as we see it, is uh, uh, well, modern large language models such as ChatGPT, which are basically an offspring of neural machine translation. The transformer was originally in, uh, invented in the context of machine translation and then served also as the base architecture of uh, large language models. This also means that a lot of the work we did for machine translation literacy could then be uh, imported into a translation specific AI literacy in the future. And again, to provide some structure to AI literacy for translation, in, interpreting, and specialized communication, we developed a, a, a draft framework, a draft AI literacy framework. This is much too encompassing. I just mentioned some, some aspects. Uh, again, we distributed overall AI literacy over five dimensions. The first is technical foundations. It's similar to 
technical MT literacy in our previous framework. Then we have domain-specific performance, being able to establish what these language models can do in language industry workflows and at which quality levels. Then, of course, the very um, important dimension of interaction, how to interact with these uh, technologies nowadays. It's via, via prompting. Let's see what, what the future brings. What are the cognitive um, in, the cognitive effects of working with these AI technologies, you, you could look from it, at it from an action theoretical standpoint, how is agency distributed between humans and AI technologies in these workflows. Implementation is similar to economic MT literacy, what you need to know if you want to implement these models in, in professional workflows. And again, the very important dimension of, of ethical societal aspects. Yeah, What are the ethical implications of working with these technologies? And this is what we intend to, to work on further in the, in the future and also operationalize at a didactic level. All right. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So now that Ralph um, covered the sort of more theoretical foundations, I will continue to present some of the um, practical skills that can be developed by using resources that we've um, created and developed uh, in our Data Lit MT project. So the Data Lit MT project uh, was funded uh, in, uh, in Germany by the Ministry of Culture and Science of North Rhine Westphalia for the duration of uh, 2021 to 2023, so a year and a half. Um, and in that time, we developed uh, didactic resources for teaching data literacy in its MT specific form. Um, to students of translation studies or similar or specialized communication programs, um, both at the bachelor and the master level. Um, and these resources can be used for teaching. They can be used also um, to teach yourself. <laughs> um, and we have our own project website, um, also a GitHub repository and a YouTube channel. And I'll go into more detail um, as to where you can find what. So basically, um, based on the theory that um, Ralph just explained, we also developed a competence matrix. Um, and in that matrix, we specifically focused on um, these keywords and uh, formulations um, to differentiate which resources we developed for sort of, we called it a basic level and which resources we developed for an advanced level. And at the basic level, we generally considered bachelor students or or in general, people that have not, for example, maybe not programmed yet before or not worked as intensely with um, NMT or how MT works. And for the advanced level, we considered more master students or people that have already worked with this a little bit. Um, and the main difference in these resources is that the basic level resources are, well, much more straightforward and accessible to use. So it's mostly about understanding um, the concepts and maybe just clicking through a notebook. And in the advanced um, level resources, it is more about doing it yourself and more about sort of already critically evaluating um, the topics as well and really um, yeah, being a little more hands-on um, than what would be required at the basic level. And on our project website, you can find all of these resources. So we have um, also the theory and the frameworks linked on this uh, project website, but specifically also all of these uh, learning resources. Um, and this is a, an overview of the resources that we have. Um, and as you can see in the level column, they are either split up into either just the basic level or an advanced level or both levels. Um, and they are um, available in different formats. So sometimes we have a paper, so mostly the theoretical uh, understanding. Um, and then oftentimes we have Jupyter notebooks as well. Um, and these Jupyter notebooks, we have really devised um, in a way that they are very accessible. So uh, they are available on Google Colab. And we really tried to make them very understandable. Um, also for people who have never programmed before or who have never opened a notebook before, um, so that they can really click through this notebook and really actually do things themselves without needing to have any prior knowledge regarding this. And um, for that, we have also created tutorial videos where we really run through these notebooks and explain everything in detail um, just to make it even more clear about 
what they need to do about maybe what pops up or what errors they might encounter um, to really just give an extra sort of helping hand as to what how the notebooks can be used. Um, and the topics that we have are on the left side. So first of all, we cover the conceptual overview, as Ralph also explained. Um, and then we have topics covering data ethics and MT, social bias and MT, um, and then MT training data preparation, um, which covers the aspect of um, how and where can I find data sources. So for example, parallel data to train my own machine translation system, um, or if you want to do a different type of analysis with that data, um, and then you can download that data, you can work with that data, so you can filter the data sets, you can um, split them up into the uh, training and test that you need. Um, and then after that, you can actually also train your own NMT model using the open um, NMT toolkit. And um, all of these things are really sort of accessible. And whenever you would need to really sort of act and do something yourself or change something in the code, we really try to explain it very clearly as well so that it should really be sort of, yes, quite accessible <laughs> for everyone. Um, and then other uh, topics we covered are terminology integration into MT models. Um, and then also quite a few notebooks on automatic uh, quality evaluation. So where you can evaluate your own translations, the one that you have previously, where you've trained your own model and translated something, you can evaluate those. And then we also have these um, companion notebooks where we explain in much more detail um, how these metrics actually work. So what are actually string matching based metrics? What are embedding based metrics? Um, and then also we have a notebook um, to evaluate um, at the document level. So not just one sentence, but where you can evaluate an entire document. And then we also have a notebook, uh, a paper on pre and post editing, and then a paper and notebook on machine translationees and post editees. Um, so these are all the learning resources that we covered um, where we have all the um, available uh, resources as mentioned here on the right side. And this is an example of um, how our notebooks look. And um, yeah, this is just like a very short <laughs> screenshot. Um, but yeah, we've always really tried to include quite some text in the notebook so that we really explain what it is that you're doing um, and how you could find some more information on it and how it works. And then usually the notebooks can be just clicked through. And yeah, like I mentioned, where you do need to change something, we really try to make it very explicit. Um, and we also explained it um, in the tutorial videos so that it should be really clear because there are and have been prior to our project quite many notebooks out there. So the code is nothing specifically new, but it's just, um, it was never explained clearly to people who have not coded before. Um, and we've really tried to, yes, have the very didactic aspect to this as well, that you can really understand um, what it is that you're doing um, and how these notebooks actually work. Um, yeah, for people who haven't programmed before as well. Um, and then, yeah, we have um, on, on our YouTube channel, we have a bunch of <laughs> videos where we really, yeah, talk through these, uh, talk through these notebooks and how they work um, that can be, yeah, viewed. If they're not necessary, that's, um, the notebooks should be technically self-explanatory as well, but this is just another sort of, uh, yeah, guiding step as well. And um, that was the project that we've yeah officially finished last year. And based on the Data Lit MT project and also another project called Mute NMT, um, we are now part of a, a bigger European funded project as well called LT Leader. Um, so this is also focusing on language and translation and the technological aspects of it. Um, and it's called Literacy in Digital Environments and Resources. And um, in that sort of consortium, we're together with um, six other universities um, led by the University Autonoma in Barcelona. Um, and we're kind of building on what we've done with the digital literacy and extending it um, and adapting it to include also newer um, developments in the field. Um, we've conducted um, already many interviews, interviewing um, experts and stakeholders in the field to see 
and to ask uh, what skills they find are necessary nowadays um, that we should focus on. And based on that, we will map sort of a landscape of technolog uh, technological capabilities that are nowadays required to work as a language and or translation expert. Um, and then once again, we will also generate training outputs. So we will um, generate also um, notebooks, but also write uh, a textbook um, that will help language and translation trainers improve their skills and adopt appropriate pedagogical approaches and strategies to integrate technology into their uh, yeah, language or translation classrooms. So we're extending and developing this project that we've been working on in the past. And I think that's it from ours. Thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, very interesting project. Um, we have time for, for questions. Um, if you have questions, please answer in the uh, please put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. In the meantime, I would like um, I have a question for Yanisa. What do you mean exactly by digital environments and resources? Because uh, thinking of Clarin, I would also say that Clarin is also a, a research infrastructure, infrastructure, a digital environment for for um, for resources um, that could also be. Uh, meaningful and meaningful for translation, for example. Mm. We well, I don't think. Resources. How do you define it, digital? Environment? Yeah. Well, there's not. Yeah. So there's not that one definition, right? So I think the way that um, we are focusing on it in the LT Leader project is that we have a mix of, first of all, a platform where everything will be accessible. So that will include also theoretical information or videos to or interviews that can be sort of more background information, but also include relative um, respective links to the outputs that we have that could then once again be notebooks. Um, but also we are working on another um, sort of updating um, the mute NMT platform where you can also um, train your own MT engine in a different way than we have with our notebooks. And then that itself would also be sort of an environment. Um, and I think the way we we are seeing it in, in our project is that we have that one main platform and linking to all these different potential environments, um, digital environments. Um, I don't know, Ralph, if you want to add anything to that or... So you did uh, an analysis of the other digital environments that could plug in into your own... Uh into your own platform if this is what you mean what, what kind of analysis like um, an analysis of other digital environments because you, you refer to more digital environments so if you just could give an example uh, to those who, who are not familiar with translation could i just add something yeah. to this um, i think we also understand digital environments as for example the the digitalized and datafied translation industry so professional settings which are heavily digitalized and then literacy in these environments means navigating these environments using digital resources at your disposal which could be translation technologies such as machine translation or translation data such as translation memories multilingual corpora etc okay. so this so is the end yeah. yeah so basically it could also be a research data repository that is storing uh corpora and that could be used for for translation right yeah, exactly. Something like the mm. Opus Corpus collection, etc. Yes. We, we, part yours, of the project yeah. will be, will be mapping the the landscape of of what is there, both yes. in terms of uh, academic um, resources, but also um, uh, practical workflows. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, one more question. I have two minutes. Uh, I'm curious. Have you tested this framework? the data literacy framework and NT literacy framework and you're also uh, you also have one already for AI. So what, what what kind of feedback? I'm very curious what kind of feedback you got from the studies or teachers who who try to adopt this framework in order to upscale their pro their their programs. In Cologne we tested it in our translation classes but there was no structured tests like having a post post hoc questionnaires, etc. We wanted to do this, but then 
well, AI uh, large language models hit, and then the world looked looked somewhat different, and we, we had to had to move on to to um, well to do conceptual work on um, uh, on large language models and AI literacy. So, I mean, I, I have sort of anecdotal feedback from my translation classes, but not structured feedback in, in terms of well, postdoc services, etc. Okay. And Can I think. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, just to add to that, I think also the sort of the framework that we've based the resources on, the data lit MT, uh, MT framework, um, is also we constructed it so that it sort of nicely fits and covers all these topics in, in a way that, yeah, the, the it flows well, um, but they can all be used uh, individually as well. So this is also one thing that um, people might be interested just in, in referring to or using parts of these of the framework or parts of the resources that we've created and not um, the entire one sort of itself. Yes, um, it's and I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think regarding the parts, like from people that have individually used them, also not not an official study, but individually, I think we got quite some good feedback. Um, just, yeah, for people that have sort of, yeah, and used some parts of it in where they thought it could be helpful for, for their teaching, their training. Um, but yeah, we haven't conducted sort of one big study to to respond to thank you i think it'll be very interesting because i'm sure that there are still uh, programs out there also in translation studies who don't have a solid framework right uh to teach these uh, technologies so it'll be very interesting to to investigate that the learning cur curve of the teachers for example who don't know how to code and also the learning curve of the students who come mm. from disciplines um for example, uh, Erasmus programs um, that come from backgrounds that it, which did not provide them with the, the right technical skills or basic tech technical skills needed to, to learn. So mm. interesting. Um, any other questions from, from our participants? Everybody's quiet. So please listen carefully because I have a question at the end of the of the session, um, and I will ask you uh, to think how will you apply the knowledge learned it during this campaign. So I'm very curious uh, what you will answer. And maybe this, yes, maybe I can testify. I have tr yes. looked at, through all the videos and oh, yes. um, you're, you're teaching this indeed. I'm I'm exactly teaching this, um, and I was very surprised and pleasantly surprised when Yanisa presented this last year in Helsinki and I thought well this is exactly what I'm doing um, but you did it in a structured way while I was just uh, yeah had improvised this over the years um, um, but but yeah so so the videos are, are very useful I use them um, as a backup for students that um, want yeah I don't record my courses so whenever they miss a course or so they can just uh, go to your uh, courses, uh, your your online videos and your notebooks for extra information. And uh, well, I just read all their papers and they all managed to train their own MT system. So it's, that's good. That's good news. So one benefit, it helps structure the, the, the work of the teachers. So that's really good. Okay, um, I will pass on the floor to Vesna who will keep, provide more information, uh, tips and tricks about uh, translation technology tools that can be used in teaching. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's me back again. Uh, I will be um, jumping a bit back in history, working with tools that have been around um, in professional practice a bit longer. And I would like to show um, how you can use this in teaching, but also as part of your research, if you are planning, for example, a project where parts of a project needs to be translated. As an example, I will take a survey uh, from my own um, research, uh, one of our projects, and I will show um, one of the workflows that is possible here. All right, so let's start. Um, I uh, borrowed uh, Ralph's uh, workflow uh, just to um, show you a very basic translation workflow, uh, very simplified. Uh, Ralph's uh, model is much more complex, if you've also seen uh, in the uh, presentation just now. 
So this is a bit of an adaptation. And what I just want to point out is that, uh, as you see, translation is just one of the boxes in this translation workflow. So um, each translation project starts with a project initiation uh, and with the general preparation uh, before we can start uh, with the translation preparation. Um, and this very much uh, varies from project to project what this can be. It can be, as we've discussed in our second presentation, for example, um, a, a preparation of a glossary or a thesaurus or a preparation of um, peril tax, such as, for example, peril corpora, uh, preparation of translation uh, memories and so on. So I will show you some of these steps um, then uh, with the help of one of the tools available. Um, I also want to point out that um, quality control, especially in professional practice, is an important step um, that uh, nowadays, especially uh, with um, translation service providers, mainly working um, with one of the ISO standard uh, 17,100 uh, is uh, a necessary step. This means typically this is a revision, meaning uh, a reviser will check the translation. But there are also automated steps that you can done, uh, do, um, and I will also show you this um, uh, with my example. Final administrative tasks can be, uh, you know, exporting your data and so on. So there are uh, some steps that we will not uh, follow through in detail. Um, I just want to show you that, of course, um, depending on the organization, on the scope, on the purpose of the translation, um, the translation process and the workflow can be adapted, can be much more complex as this um, uh, simplifies uh, translation workflow. As an example, um, here the European Social Survey, uh, where you see that um, in addition to um, several translation steps, revision steps, verifications, pretests, proofreadings, and so on, there are several steps involved because this is a um, quite an endeavor in preparation of such uh, transnational uh, service. As, uh, so um, this is uh, just an example uh, that I want to show you. So in order to simplify this and automate this process, uh, we typically um, use uh, translation technology, but this is not necessarily only technology that serves for purpose for translation. There are also other technologies that can um, help you with this. I just want to um, point out um, the Clarin tool inventory that you can find um, under this link. And here, um, especially, I would like to point out to the machine translation um, by Lindat. Um, and as you see, there are other tools also uh, available. Um, the professional translation bureaus, um, organizations, and so on may also use, for example, translation management systems, uh, quality assurance systems, and so on. Um, as you see, based on this um, atlas of language technology um, in for the purpose of translation industry, um, there are tools in uh, yeah uh, large numbers available on the market. So I'd like to invite you to check this atlas um, for uh, more details. Coming back to translation technology uh, proper, I will use a very old typology of translation technology just to show you that um, typically in the translation practice and in professional translation we made a distinction between two types of translation technology and this is whether this was machine aided human translation meaning that the human translation was central to the translation process and the machine was just helping the human translator to translate or this was human-aided machine translation. Typically, this means that a machine translation does the translation. However, the source text is being pre-edited so that common problems are already remedied before the text is translated. Or the output of machine translation is post-editing, meaning 
the errors and so on are remedied after the uh, translation proper is done. Um, nowadays, this distinction is very much questioned. You will see in my example that you can do both in one system. So um, there is kind of like a gray zone uh, and not so clear cut distinction anymore. Um, what you encounter in your everyday life is probably fully automatic translation. If you're using, for, ex for example, um, translation uh, services for GIST translation, as I've, sh uh, as I've shown you in my um, first presentation, Google Lens and so on, where you just use the translation and you do not make any intervention in the text uh, before or after. Then the goal of machine translation development, LLM models, and so on, is of course fully automatic, high quality translation. This means that the ultimate goal is that there is no uh, human intervention uh, necessary. Um, since translation, as we've discussed before, is um, such a multifaceted um, and multi-step process, it typically means that um, nowadays human intervention is still necessary just because the purpose of translation uh, the target group of translation, the context in which the translation is produced, or the, uh, or if this is a text that is produced multilingually per se, um, just requires a human intervention with the help of uh, technology. So I would like to start with a uh, machine-aided human translation. Uh, which some of you may also know as uh, CAT tools, CAT tools, um, stands for Computer Aided or Computer Assisted Translation. And this is typically a tool that a professional um, translator working in specialized translation would use. Um, sometimes um, these tools are also called translation memory systems or translation uh, environments. Um, here you see a screenshot of a typical tool. This is MemoQ, and this is a tool that is quite popular with uh, translators. Um, before moving on and before going into uh, details that are maybe uh, not necessary for a first encounter, have you ever worked with translate with a CAT tool? I'm wondering. Just give me a sign um, if you have, I would be happy to hear, just say yes, or please um, just give yeah. a sign that you have worked with the tool. <laughs> yes. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, so we do have some users that already have the experience here. Um, since the majority is uh, silent, I um, guess that the majority has not worked with this tool, which is um, okay. Um, this is what we are going to um, have a look at now. So um, first of all, the um, availability of tools is quite large uh, today on the market. Um, on the left-hand side, you have some tools that um, if you are familiar with these tools, uh, you have already encountered in your uh, translation practice, for example, or in teaching experience, such as Stratos, um, MemoQ, Phrase, and so on. Um, however, these tools, um, of course, do cost um, quite a bit. Uh, and if you are only an occasional translator um, that you are doing translation work as part of your research pro uh, project or similar for a survey, uh, this may probably be not, not be in the budget. So on the uh, right-hand side, uh, I'm suggesting some tools that are either um, uh, free or are uh, available um, for um, not uh, too many euros. <laughs> um, first tool is uh, MateCat. This is the tool that I will uh, also show you today. Um, so uh, we will talk a bit more about it later. Then Omega T is a freeware and an open source uh, tool. Um, um, also works in um, all environments, meaning also on Linux um, and Mac engines. 
And the last one is Cafetran. Uh, here you have um, a certain number of segments that you can translate uh, for free. And after that, uh, you need to uh, pay, um, but it is uh, much, much cheaper than the tools that you see on your left-hand side. Um, regarding the tool, um, the architecture of each of these tool is quite similar. So the majority of translation happens in the so-called translation editor. And um, this is, um, so to say, a part of this tool where you see the translation, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, the source text, which is segmented and you then enter your own translation. What is interesting in this tool is the fact that you have a lot of supporting language technology that helps you with translation. On one hand, modern CAT tools um, have integrated uh, via plugins, typically machine translation. So you can also get um, machine translation um, examples that you can then, of course, post edit. You can also integrate a uh, terminology management module where you can add, for example, your glossaries. You can also um, add a translation memory. And this is also the part of the tool that gave these uh, tools the name. So let's talk a bit about the translation memory. Um, this is quite an old approach. So a translation memory is a database that contains fast translation. It is uh, an aligned um, language resource that you can then re reuse uh, if a similar translation uh, is needed. So this means that you are reusing your old translations uh, with this uh, uh, language resource with translation memory. What does this mean in terms of productivity? You can reuse all of your old translations that you have, for example, already checked um, regarding quality. Um, and um, this means that you can speed up your translation process. On the other hand, if you are working collaboratively with other people, because you have such a large uh, volume of translation, you can also make sure that you translate consistently in the translation team. You can also ensure that you uh, translate consistently through uh, several documents, projects, and so on. So a translation memory is really an integral part of nowadays translation uh, practice. Um, translation memory is not only a part of a translation memory system, but um, can also be regarded as a language resource. So if you are looking for already existing translations that, for example, professional translators have done in order to reuse them in your, for example, translation classroom and so on, I'll invite you to have a look at the translation memories in Clarin. You can find them easily through the Clarin um, Virtual Language Observatory by just uh, searching for translation memories. Um, another useful language resource that you can reuse in a CAD tool are also parallel corpora. Parallel corpora can be reused as translation memories in a CAD tool, you basically have an aligned uh, source and target text, or at least two texts. So in Clarin, you also have a um, resource families, uh, family, excuse me, on uh, parallel corpora. So I'll, find, I'll invite you to uh, check if um, an interesting parallel corpus for your language combination or for your translation classroom uh, is also um, available in our resource family. All right. Um, I just want to briefly come back to our workflow. And before showing you how uh, a CAD tool works, I want to just uh, point out that a workflow in a modern CAD tool uses the results from a translation memory as well as from machine translation. So this basically means that as a translator, you are often post-editing, you are translating, and you are re-adapting 
your old translations. So this is a very interesting uh, work that uh, as a translator you are doing nowadays. Um, you are basically uh, a jack of all trades doing uh, many uh, translation uh, processes uh, at the same time. So just once again, the idea of a translation memory is not an automated translation. So this is not similar to, for example, DeepL or machine translation uh, such as Google Translate. But the idea is that you recycle and reuse your old translations. So here you even have a basic example um, of a repetitive conte uh, content. So this is a new sentence comes up again in this text. And for this reason, my old translation is being suggested to me and I can you know, reuse it or adopt it if needed. So this is the basic approach in CAT tools in CAT tools. And I would like to show you this today um, based on MateCat. MateCat is a um, open source free software. Um, and you can also download the, co the code and build your customized version. Uh, you can find the code on GitHub. I just posted this in, um, in the chat box. But for just you know translation, you don't not uh, you don't need to do this. You can just access this um, via a browser. So as already being said, I will take a questionnaire as an example, um, just how to use a cat tool in um, a research project, for example. And here you have just a snippet. This was um, a, a longer um, questionnaire with forty five or so. Um, items. I'm just showing you that you have, uh, you know, the typical organization of um, a questionnaire. Since your um, source text in the um, uh, project may have different uh, files or maybe available in different files, um, XML and so on, um, I just want to point out that MateCat supports different uh, file formats um, and almost everything is covered. Uh, once you upload the document to MateCat, it is all automatically analyzed. And this means that you also see how many repetitions are in your document. Uh, if you already have matches, for example, from translation memory, if you've translated something similar before. And this can also help you with um, adjusting your translation process to also timing your uh, translation process. Then let's have a look at the translation editor. So in the translation editor in MateCAD, you do have two types of matches. You have matches from machine translation. Um, as you see, this is this uh, yellow sign MT, and I can post edit this suggestion and accept this suggestion or start from scratch if I'm not happy um, with the machine translation. But I can also reuse uh, matches from translation memory. And as soon as you are working with a text that requires consistency, where you have, for example, as in a survey, please enter your answer here and so on, you do want to focus on the consistency and therefore you want to utilize and recycle your old translations. Um, and um, this way, this uh, translation that you've done before is auto-propagated. This means it is pre-translated uh, for you. Um, you can also use some advanced tools such as consistency control. So for example, if um, a colleague decides to translate um, part of your questionnaire differently, there's a pop-up that tells you, attention, this is maybe not ideal. Um, consistency may suffer. Um, you can also control the process of the translation by you know, incorporating several steps. So to say, if you want to start with a draft translation, um, then move on um, to, um, for example, um, a translated text. And if you want to incorporate a revision step, this means that Another person has a look at the translation um, versus the um, source text. You can also then incorporate an approved step. So this allows you really a nice 
process and workflow control on the segment level, not only on the whole document. Um, additionally, you can build in um, quality control where you really have a look and evaluate the translation. This is already uh, quite an advanced step uh, where you can, for example, decide what kind of an error has been done. Um, is this a major, a minor error and so on? So this is then um, some kind of a quality report that he is generated here. This may be also useful um, if you are outsourcing a translation and you as a translate, um, um, uh, excuse me, as a researcher are doing the revision and you want to um, also quantify the errors that have been done in order to give a feedback to this translator and also to decide whether, you know, you want to use the same translator again um, in this research process, uh, project or not. All right. Um, after the translation has been produced, whether you wanted to do a revision or not, uh, after you are uh, at the end of your translation project, you export the document. And as you see, this is the final result of these two items. You do not have to uh, basically do much uh, formatting, editing since the um, uh, this CAD tool already takes care of the um, formatting. So you see, I started with a German text and now I have an English text in uh, the same manner. So um, I can wholeheartedly recommend uh, MateCAD. It's very intuitive, it's free, um, and um, it has been used, for example, in our BA program where students do not have so much experience with such tools. There is nothing that uh, can go wrong um, and uh, it doesn't um, require any installation. So uh, for a very low barrier um, entry into the uh, translation with translation technology is very helpful. Um, since, especially in social sciences, you also may want to uh, work with multimodal resources, such as, for example, education resources, interviews, and so on. Um, you may be interested, for example, in subtitling. Um, and here you can also use um, MateCAD, for example, or another CAD tool uh, for the translation per se. But in order to um, generate the captions, you will need additional tools. I can recommend, for example, uh, Subtitle Edit, which is also a uh, free tool um, so that you generate the captions uh, in the source language uh, export the file into MateCAD and translate then uh, in MateCAD. I would like to point out that CAD tools are extremely popular in the translation um, profession and in translation companies, uh, especially now with the addition of machine translation uh, plugins. However, especially in research, you may want to consider some limitations regarding privacy and personal data. So especially um, if you are not using a serv server or a desktop client, so you're using an internet browser based CAT tool, you may want to um, have a look um, how this data is being stored, reused and so on. Um, since, especially in social uh, sciences, there may be some data uh, that is quite sensible. Um, another thing to point out, if you're working with material that needs context, as you have seen in my examples, um, the um, segments that appear are without a context. So you do not see where exactly on the page is um, uh, this segment located that you are translating. You do not see the pictures and so on. So this is something that needs um, a bit adjusting if you're just starting out with a CAD tool. And another important thing uh, that we called uh, the GIGO effect, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So if your translation is rubbish uh, and you are reusing your old translation, you should not expect any wonders. You will get the same translation back that you've produced the first time if you have not edited it properly. 
So this is all uh, from me. Uh, I'd like to invite some questions. Um, if you have them, um, I'd be glad uh, to help you uh, with any uh, questions regarding cat tools or um, the workflows. Yeah, Francesca? I have a curiosity. Yeah. Um, we sometimes also have a number of McLaren uh, 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 of multilingual terminologies. Uh, is it is there a way to reuse these uh, in uh, CAT tools, for instance? Yes, it, there is. Um, I'll just I'll just go back briefly. I haven't really gone into details, um, but um, pa, pa, pa. here you see um, there is. Every cat tool has a terminology management module. Um, in MateCat is fairly limited. So it basically, it's a simple word list with some additional information, but for um, an occasional translator, I think it suffices. For a professional translator, it's maybe not enough. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions? If uh, there are any topics that you would like to receive more information on, uh, we can also send you up to the cafe. Um, Bibiana has a question. Do any of these tools connect to Tazauri or such semantic resources? Um, not really. Um, in These tools are developed for translation practice and translators typically do not work with um, ontologies. I mean, we do reuse them, you know, to look something up, but not uh, really intensively. So unless you have um, quite a, you know, extensive workflow from RDF to TBX or something similar, then you could reuse it. But for an occasional translator, this is too much uh, work, I would suggest. Directly, it doesn't work. So indeed, I don't know if this is uh, among the many uh, uh, notebooks that have been made available, but I guess uh, going from, uh, I don't know, for instance, an RDF or a, a terminology or thesaurus in SCOS uh, to um, something that can be much more simplified than the word list that can be directly injected uh, in MateCut would probably be something that uh, fills the gap between uh, uh, existing uh, digital resources and uh, uh, working uh, uh, project, right? Yes, I guess so. The question is if there is really a need for this, you know, um... I I think that if, translators often work ad hoc, meaning if they do not in, know a certain term, they just look it up and that's it. So the question is whether it is a large scale translation that requires such a resource, then it would make sense. Uh, but for your everyday translation, uh, probably not. Yeah, I don't know, Juliana, what do you think? Yes, if I if I remember correctly from a few uh, back a few years ago, when I also used to teach cat tools, I think SDL um, at that time um, one of the cat tools you just also mentioned. I think now they they are called somewhere else, uh, something else. Um, uh, they try to integrate a large um, terminology resource, but I don't remember anymore which one. Uh, Eurolex. Um, or something like that and they piloted that with the professional translators and indeed there was not enough interest to uh, to implement that um as as an as an additional feature on top of their term base something like that but um answering to Viviana I think if let's say a platform or semantic uh, a platform uh, which hosts semantic resources, if there is an API, you can always go to one of these cat tools providers and then try to convince them to create a plugin for you. Um, and then this is one way to customize uh, MateCat, for example, of any other of the open source uh, translation tools uh, to your own workflow. If I'm not mistaken, in the Shock project, uh, we did that. I think uh, MateCat was, or another tool that was really customized to the researchers' workflow, you know, for collaborative translation. Mm. Uh, I have. Yeah, to indeed, I think that in, it's it's yeah. indeed the ESS also uh, 
exactly. that was translated within that project. So I do I cannot remember whether there was this customization, but uh, I can very well imagine uh, it, it being so. So yeah, I think there are a number of contexts uh, in which this could be useful, especially when you know that there is an already existing very comprehensive uh, uh, multilingual terminology. So it is something that definitely uh, to keep an eye on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vesna. Um, if there are no more questions, I will pass the floor to Vincent, who is going to teach us uh, how MP works. All right, there are a few, um, these are a few of the tools and resources uh, you could use. So the Opus Parallel Corpora has already been mentioned, which is a very useful resource if you want to build your own MT systems. The Open NMT uh, Toolkit, which is also what Yanisa was talking about, uh, it's very useful. You only have three commands to train your own open, uh, your own NMT system. Um, then there is, of course, the Clarin uh, repositories. And then there is the hardware infrastructure of Google Colab and Kaggle, which provide free GPUs, which is what you need these days to train your uh, neural machine translation systems. So, but how does it all work now? Well, it's all... Um, question of uh, language modeling and language modeling is trying to predict uh, words based on the context. So, so you provide the model with a context and then it has to predict it's either the next word or a word in the middle between uh, yeah, future context and past context. And a side effect of these um, of this language modeling in this uh, neural era is the fact that uh, words get represented as a series of numbers, as vectors. And uh, if we, and these vectors, you could look at these vectors as coordinates in a multidimensional space. Um, so if we would have only two uh, numbers, then we can uh, project them in a, in a plane, as you can see here. And then um, a side effect of that is that words um, that have a similar meaning end up closer together. So, um, so we represent every word as a series of numbers, and these numbers or points, uh, yeah, point to a, a multi-dimensional space, and um, and and this uh, position in this space is kind of the meaning representation of the words. And uh, when words are closer together, they um, have a similar meaning. That's the general uh, large progress that has been made in uh, natural language processing since <laughs> since 2013 and since the neural era, I think. Yeah. Um, so what's even more is that we can do, um, uh, yeah, this allows us to do to, to, uh, have uh, generalizations over words. So as we uh, abstract away from the literal string of the words, so the, the letters or the characters, uh, we we have this um, yeah this this areas in the in the in the semantic space which which give us generalizations, and even more uh, also relations between words can be uh, modeled. Uh, um, so, for instance, we can do word arithmetic and say king minus man plus woman and then end up near the point where queen uh, should be uh, represented. So this provides uh, great generalizations and that's the advantage of word embeddings. Now, word embeddings, uh, well, in, in machine translation, we mainly work... Uh, sentence per sentence, which is not necessarily uh, the end goal, but up to now it's mainly sentence per sentence. And so we need a sentence representation. And a word vector we call also a word embedding. And so a sentence embedding then is the vector representing uh, the meaning of a sentence. So a series of numbers representing the meaning of a sentence. So and, um, in recurrent neural networks, for instance, um, we can see uh, when we have read one word, we build up the meaning of a sentence based on that one word. We take a next word we uh, and, and we add the previous meaning of the sentence up to that word. 
and the meaning of the new word and we uh, yeah and the meaning of the sentence up to that point changes a bit and so on until we're at the end of the sentence and we end up with a representation i don't know whether you can see my uh, pointer my arrow here um, but we end up with a representation at the end of the sentence and that should be done the meaning of a sentence well in the era of the recurrent neural networks that was so, so the thing is um so when we have this sentence representation um we uh, we can use it to pass it on so we read in the input string um in the encoder and then we build up a context representation a sentence representation and we pass it on to the decoder which then generates uh, the target language. So that was the the first uh, approach to neural machine translation, let's say before uh, 2017. Um, and um, well, that that has a downside that we, we would say that we can represent any meaning of any sentence in a limited series of numbers. So that that's not possible. So the next step is then um, cross-lingual attention. And in cross-lingual attention, we read in each word again, and we build up a meaning representation, just as I explained earlier for the recurrent neural networks. But now instead of passing on only the sentence uh, embedding or a, a one vector for the whole sentence, we now pass on the vectors at each point of the sentence. And um, uh, each each of these um, uh, hidden states that you see in between, they're, they're actually sentence representations because here is present left to right, but it's also right to left at the same time. Um, and so we, we pass it on multiple uh, representations of the sentence after reading certain words. This was the, what we call cross-lingual attention, and it greatly improved. And you can look at it as a kind of alignment between uh, source word and target words, but not uh, a strict alignment, but uh, a stochastic alignment. So with probability, so we can see here that um, when we generate the word I, that it's uh, strongly linked to je in French, am um, is strongly linked to sui and a student is linked to étudiant. Um, and then comes the next step, then we're at transformers. And uh, transformers nowadays, uh, that's the state of the art. And instead of, um, well, previously we had cross-lingual attention, now we have self-attention. And that's um, when every word in the sentence is linked to every other word in the sentence and it learns the relation between every yeah, every every two words in the sentence learn the relations. Uh, well, the network learns the relations between them, and then um, builds up representations for that. And um, and then in the target language, we also do this, plus all the links to the source words. So that's many more links uh, and, and much more information. And uh, the big uh, upside of these transformers is that they uh, do not lose the information which has been, uh, which has happened or which has appeared in words uh, l quite some time ago. So uh, where recurrent neural networks build up a representation of the sentence and, and words that are farther away from the current point uh, have uh, like are, are largely forgotten or, or their uh, meaning is, is less represented in Transformers. This is no longer the case. And this is the great leap forward since 2018 or 17, yeah. So Transformers are uh, the T in, in models like ChatGPT. Yeah. So, and this self-attention, why? what is it good for? What it allows, for instance, correct uh, co-reference of resolution. So here we have the example of the animal didn't cross the street because it was two and then the next word tired uh, depends. So if we have tired, then it means that it points to animal. And if we have why, then it means that it was point to street. And so our neural network has, our transformer has learned the relation between it and street and it and animal, uh, depending on words like uh, tired and so on.
This also allows to have better translations as uh, we need those uh, to solve these uh, co-references to get uh, correct translations, for instance, when we go from English uh, to French. Now that's uh, for the neural machine translation starting from scratch. But since, uh, let's say, uh, two years ago, we're in the era of the large language models. And um, so they're a form of transfer learning. In transfer learning, we have a system that's trained on a specific task. And then we switch to, uh, and we use that information um, to get kick-started in, in another task. And we, uh, so we, we transferred the knowledge that was learned in one task and are able to use it in another task, um, which gives us a, yeah, a great uh, he head start compared to starting from scratch. So the first stage is called the pre-training. That's the large language models, um, which are trained on monolingual texts. Uh, so non-parallel texts, and these texts could be in multiple languages. And then there is the fine tuning stage where we, teach these, well, we adapt these pre-trained language models to for specific tasks, like in our case, and would be translation. We could do that by providing limited amounts of parallel text, much smaller than in uh, than before the LLMs where we had to have or learn everything from the parallel data. So what kind of um, models? Do we have, well, there are uh, um, contextual, sorry. I, so we have the, the encoders, so um, that's contextual embeddings. So what I showed before with the word embeddings that were words in, uh, as they were written, they have one meaning in space. With the uh, BERT uh, embeddings, we have uh, words in a specific context that are pointed in space which gives us the big advantage of being that they are disambiguated uh, depending on the context. So um, for homonyms, for instance, uh, this works much better. Um, and so BERT's models are trained on masking out words and they, the model has to learn to predict, uh, predict the missing words. So here we see, for instance, um, we provide as input how are mask doing today? And the model has to learn how are you doing today, for instance. So, um, and it has to learn to predict that. So that's encoders. So what these models do is they, we give it a sentence and we get um, indication of each word in the sentence where it is in the semantic space. So we get out the list of vectors, so numbers. Um, then we have the encoder decoder models. So that's at the bottom of the slide, the, the BART models. And we have also the, um, the decoder only models, that's the GPT models. So I'll briefly go into BART models. So those are more the tra like traditional uh, MT models. Um, but now we start from um, a parallel, uh, we, we start from uh, large language models that have been trained before. Huh? So how do these models learn? Well, we give them monolingual text. Uh, so um, where, for instance, we uh, switch around sentences and the, the model has to learn to get the sentences in the right order. Uh, we mask out words and it has to learn to uh, insert those words. Uh, and we can do that in multiple languages, but not parallel text uh, in the same semantic space. And then at the second stage, we can fine tune these models uh, and, and uh, give them parallel data and then they will be able, so in, this is example of Japanese to English, and then uh, the model will have learned much better to translate. Well, that's the assumption. And then finally, we have the GPT models. So that's uh, where chat GPT is the most famous uh, form of. Um, so these are uh, pre-trained again on, um, on basic language modeling. And um, and then they are fine tuned on specific behavior and chat GPT is then fine tuned specifically on uh, 
talking to uh, to humans, chatting, and but we could also uh, um, fine tune these GPT models on translation. Um, so we call them autoregressive models because they they always predict the next word. So whenever you give a prompt. Uh, they will just uh, continue based on where your prompt ends um, and uh, predict the next word. And once they predicted one word, they will add that to its input in the next uh, round to predict the next word. Uh, as they are transformers, they have learned all the links between all these words that they also uh, have generated themselves and the words in your prompts. And so this is why uh, they... They seem quite clever, these models. How can we fine tune these uh, GPT models for machine translation? Well, by uh, giving uh, texts uh, like the following, translate into French, English is I am a student, French is je suis étudiant. If we train it on sentence like that, and then we provide it with prompts like translate into French and we give it another English sentence, then it'll have, if we give it enough of these sentences, learned how to translate. And so we could fine tune GPT modes for machine translation. Now, which approach works best? The large language models or the uh, more traditional neural MT models, which uh, I haven't, no, uh, don't use large language models. Well, uh, in the WMT shared task, so that's a competition for machine translation, uh, last year's results was the first time that large language models were included. Um, and they were not, uh, well, there are different competitions on different uh, domains, but the LLMs were not always among the best systems. Uh, and uh, well, GPT-4 is, well, as you already know, um, it sometimes uh, hallucinates or Im improvises information which was not there in the source. So they're not always that faithful. Um, so the conclusion of the WMT, and I think it's the conclusion of what we, I can say here today as well is large language models, they're here, but they're not quite there yet. Um, so we'll see in the next years whether this will change or not. And so this was a very brief uh, um, yeah, introduction to how machine translation works these days. Thank you very much, Vincent. I found this very useful. Did you find uh, this session useful? Hello, Edmund, I see. Did you find the session useful? Yes, yes, unfortunately, I, uh, thanks for asking. Um, I write very late. Uh, I'm a total beginner here and uh, I'm trying to, to get into such waters. So, yeah, it was it was interesting. So I, I got a few things and I hope I will um, be present in the future. So I'm looking forward. Uh, Christina from Ljubljana. How did you enjoy the event? Did you find it useful? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and... Um... I have a question actually. Um, I would like to know whether you, if I understand correctly, you, you are already uh, using the, um, these contents to, uh, in uh, uh, university classes. And um, uh, I would like to know how, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, how many hours of uh, uh, teaching does it take? Uh, to introduce even the basics uh, in, a, for example, a translation course, because uh, well, uh, in this 20 minute introduction, I must say, I, I really struggled to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to follow the explanations. Uh, and um, uh, I, I teach translation uh, um, uh, Japanese to Slovene and uh, uh, usually the um, we already have very limited time to uh, cover the linguistic part, uh, just learning the language, and uh, um, and I was wondering um, what balance uh, you have, uh, or anyone who is uh, introducing uh, this sort of um, uh, uh, 
on uh, expertise on uh, NT and uh, cartoons, etc., in translation classes. No, I can say I, I teach this in uh, postgraduate in uh, translation technology, but the students are translators, so they're uh, very uh, outside of their comfort zone when um, we start on, on machine translation and especially on the hands-on sessions with the Google Colabs and uh, the actual training. And um, well, that's a one semester, three hours per week course. So it's not it's not twenty five minutes. Um, now I had to rush a bit, um, uh, but then we take our time to uh, to do it properly. But yeah, I think if you need to do this as a side thing in other courses, then you can only uh, briefly touch upon on on things. But but even then, I think uh, yeah giving them providing your students with pointers where they can find more information because all this information is available uh, online in uh, not always very readable form but um, yeah it is it is all available so that's uh, and freely available so that that's a good point thank you uh, Christina at what level do you teach sorry I didn't get it at the B uh, level um the uh translation courses is, is at the master's level but still only uh, after only three years starting from scratch learning japanese uh, students still need uh, just basic training in language and translation mm -hmm. i see uh, vesna maybe vesna also has your experience in teaching cat tools yes um I need to make a side note. We are a translation program, so it's not, you know, part of philology. Um, and in Vienna at BA level, we have a dedicated lecture for machine translation in BA, two hour lecture and two hour lab session per week. And then on master level, um, we have um, a two hour lab session on CAD tools and so on two-hour session per week on terminology and language resources and two-hour lab um, on, let's call it AI, but large language models and so on. Um, yeah, and we still think it's not enough. <laughs> um, our, our approach is that uh, we teach the, let's call it technical skills in the specialized um, courses and lab sessions. And then we have specialized translation courses such as legal translation and so on. And there we assume that uh, students, uh, you know, in terms of situated learning, uh, know how to use these tools and it's their responsibility to, uh, you know, become a proficient user and to use the tools as much as possible. But we don't do, you know, um, click here, click there uh, approach. Thank you. Any other questions? No? So um, maybe this is also a good opportunity to tell you that, um, so Clarin, uh, we recently um, launched the Trainers Network in Clarin and uh, Vesna is also part of this Trainers Network. Um, so we are happy to support, um, let's say university programs who are, um, who are looking for experts, for example, to teach uh, a guest lecture, give a guest lecture on a topic, for example, the topic of translation. Uh, you could invite uh, Vesna as a Clarin trainer to, to give a session at your university, a guest lecture on the topic of even Vincent and uh, Clarin is, is, um, is willing, more than happy, to, we are more than happy to support uh, this uh, exchange of knowledge uh, because it is a research, research infrastructure me meant to, um, to exchange knowledge and expertise. Um, so uh, please contact me at training.clarin.eu and um, let me know if you, if you need, if you're interested in such an exchange. And um, what else, uh, if I can just for a minute uh, wrap up. And I wanted to draw your attention to the upcoming events. 
and um, useful resources and links. Uh, we also have mobility grants. Um, please take a look at the, on our funding page in case you're interested to apply. And um, the Clarin uh, next cafe, we don't know yet. Uh, probably in yeah, it may be a dedicated the... to the uh, SSH of the marketplace. So it is a it is another a kind of platform that gathers together resources from uh, uh, Clarin and other uh, social sciences and humanities uh, uh, infrastructures. So, but uh, the, in any case, uh, for the latest Clarin Cafe, you can always go to this page and see what's on, what's on top. And um, yeah, uh, I think that then uh, there is a, we also have technical hour, open hours uh, that are held regularly. This is also more for our uh, uh, experts from our centers, but uh, there may be topics that are of interest to you. And finally, uh, we uh, have our annual Clarin conference coming up, and this can also be uh, um, attended virtually. So there will be announcements and uh, links to to be able for you to be able to register. Yes. So I think that's all from from us today. Thanks again for. Uh, attending and thanks to all of uh, our speakers today and ah, okay Hans Michael Miki here <laughs> my uh, former colleague from CNR uh, is also saying that he appreciated sono contenta Miki <laughs> and uh, hope that uh, you're going to tell me how you're going to apply all this knowledge that you acquired <laughs> bye bye everyone nice bye bye and thank you very much to all the speakers thank you so thank you, you so much, much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.